Hi everyone and welcome to Political Forum. I'm Mike Jacobson and this is your chance to speak with elected officials here inside the city of Chicago. Joining us tonight is Illinois State Rep. Aaron Ortiz who represents the 1st District. Representative Ortiz, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a All pleasure. Right. All right, folks, this is now your chance. If you have a question, comment, or concern for the representative, the number's at the bottom of the screen, 312-738-1060. That's 312-738-1060. And please, folks, you got to know that we're also streaming on live at can, online at cantv.org slash hotline. That's cantv.org slash hotline. Okay. All right, so let's get this, the, this show rolling. Um... You're, you're, you're basically sort of, kind of, sort of new yes. you know, to Springfield, so, so why don't you tell people you know, about yourself and, and, and how you got in this position? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I'm a Chicago native, born and raised in the city of Chicago. I've been here for 27 years. I'm from the Gage Park neighborhood. But uh, I am the, one of the uh, youngest serving uh, legislators down in Springfield. Um, I was one of the youngest members until the recent appointee, uh, Representative Barbara Hernandez. But um, I am... Prior to getting to this position, I worked as a college and career counselor at Back of the Yards College Prep High School. And with my experience working with students, uh, nonprofit organizations in the community, and my background in, as of an urban planning degree just made me really understand what government can do for us. And working on many different projects down in Champaign-Urbana with government organizations, government entities, officials, I thought, you know what, this is what government can be. So uh, after working some time in the community, I realized that there was an opportunity to really bring representation to the first district of Illinois, which is uh, the second largest Latino district in the state of Illinois, and also has a lot of youth, um, a lot of youth that uh, need representation. So I really um, started to get involved in many different campaigns, whether it was with the Chicago Teachers Union trying to get Karen Lewis on the ballot to you know, be mayor, or whether it was uh, knocking on doors for uh, True Garcia when he was running for mayor, really just uh, started to understand what the political process could bring to our community, and that was just representation. Well, so you, you brought up Karen Lewis. So let's talk about it. because you 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 were a, you know you, you worked for the for, for CPS. Um, number one, one of the things that people always talk about is an elected school board. Yeah. Now now you're down in Springfield. The, the, this is an, this is an issue that that comes up. What's your opinion on them? You know, uh, well, I, first of all, I want to thank uh, now Senator Martwick, uh, then Representative uh, Martwick, who was really has be, really been working on this issue for quite some years, and I think that it's very important that our city has an elected school board because at the moment it's uh, it's appointed, right? The mayor chooses who who is on that board, and I think that just being a state representative, I've come to understand that we really need elected representation. And if we elect someone from our community, I think that that, that representation will just really reflect more of what the community needs and concerns are. And then the other issue now, which is uh, they're talking about, you know, school started in CPS this week, um, and there's talks that there, there could be a possible strike that could be even by the end of the month. Uh, well, what's your take on that? So, uh, again, you know, you mentioned that I was I an was, uh, educator. I worked yeah. at Back of the Arts College Prop at Chicago Public School, and in those five years, working at a school that was pretty much brand new, um, seeing the need for social workers, seeing the need for a librarian. That happened at a school that was brand new in the inner city of Chicago in back of the yards. Seeing the students not have that mental health support. Um, there was a social worker who was at her school and uh, she, she uh, found another position unfortunately and there was a gap at our school for about a year and a half or two and so many students coming in asking for this specific uh, social worker and her not being there was just very hurtful. There's uh, understanding that the closest mental health facility is two, three miles away and mm -hmm. when the, the student doesn't have a parent to give them a ride there. Um, that's hurt, that, that hurts me because that's in my own community. So. This is, again, this is a school that's pretty much brand new and we didn't have a librarian or a social worker. I can just imagine the schools who have been in some communities for quite some time and are being underfunded. We were being funded the way we were supposed to and we weren't receiving the things we needed. So just being an educator, working within the counseling department, I understand that our youth of color, our students of color, our students from the city of Chicago, I'm a Chicago public uh, graduate myself, 
we deserve more. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think that uh, what the Chicago Teachers Union is asking for is more social workers, librarians in schools. These are just things that our students need. Mm -hmm. Our students, of, our youth of Chicago have been yearning for. Um, and again, just having been a, a Chicago Public School employee for five years, so many of these teachers are working their butts off. They don't leave the school till 6 p.m. They come in early. Many of these teachers are concerned of their students not seeking that mental health care for their not being a social worker. You know, our principal were, was consistently uh, reminding us that we will hire a social worker. We will hire a social worker. That's what we are continuously are hearing from the city as well, the city of Chicago. We, you will eventually get this. And I think that the Chicago Teachers Union has every right to demand more for, again, the youth. And I'm uh, fully supportive of the Chicago Teachers Union wanting to strike. So uh, besides this, because you know, when you ran for office, you, you mentioned three priorities, school funding. Yes housing security and health care. So we really, so school funding, we, we just basically went over that. Talk about housing security and, and, and where you are today with that. Absolutely. So, um, you know, being in the city of Chicago, we're starting mm -hmm. to see many rising costs in living and rent. And I think that, uh, again, there's so many working class families here in the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago. But many people are starting to leave just because, especially the city of Chicago, the inner city, starting to be kind of priced out. Yeah, uh, many families aren't able to afford the rent. Many developers that are coming in and increasing the property taxes, increasing the rents. So I think housing affordability is very important for us to continue to work on here in the state. Um, but one of the things that really uh, I focused on and worked with many members of the Latino Caucus on is um, housing affordability and making sure that there's rights in place. Uh, legislation in place to protect our immigrant tenants because so many uh, tenants are are taking advantage of because of their citizenship status if they complain to a landlord that something isn't fixed a landlord can easily just say I'm gonna go ahead and call ice on you don't say anything so there's a lot of threats threats like that that are impacting our, our community right now and the state of Illinois is really uh, making sure that we're addressing these issues by passing legislation that's going to, you know, makes uh, housing a, a right, a right that shouldn't be scared of, of uh, being evicted from your home just because of your, of your citizenship status. We're going to get, uh, back to as you just mentioned, Absolutely. that we'll get that in a little bit, Absolutely. but it's the third point that, that, that you really ran on was also was uh, health care. This is not only a local issue, this is not only a state issue, but this is a national yes. issue. So, so what are you doing to help forward this conversation, you know, to, to help uh, to make health care, you know, equal and affordable for everyone? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, this, living in the city of Chicago, I live on the southwest side and oftentimes to seek health care. Uh, my mom and I would take the western bus all the way down to the north side and it was about a 30 minute bus ride to seek health care because it's just the limited opportunities that existed on the southwest side 25 years ago. But um, knocking on doors, talking to my constituents, I would always talk about different issues, being up different issues, property taxes, X, Y, and Z, but many of the issue, one of the issues that was consistently coming up at the doors was I can't afford my insurance. I can't afford uh, seeking emergency care. And to me, I, I figured, I, I thought to myself, this is an issue that's important to my community, so we need to make sure to uh, address this. So one of the, the ways that uh, I passed the bill, House Bill 30, uh, 3487, which would require hospitals to post information in their emergency rooms on how to enroll into the Illinois health insurance marketplace, mm -hmm. because there's so many people who uh, aren't enrolled and under the, the cuts that were made to the Affordable, health, uh, Affordable Care Act, really impacted the outreach to our communities on how to enroll into insurance. So I think because of these cuts, we've, uh, we haven't really seen an increase in enrollments into insurance. So this bill would just provide uh, some additional information on how to enroll. I think that we, there's still a lot more work for us to do to make sure that all of the state, the state of Illinois, you know, I think health care is, is, should be just a fundamental human right. People, right. if they're not feeling well, they should uh, feel that they are able to go to the hospital and 
not have to then owe the hospital thousands of dollars. Right, 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 right. Excellent point. Um, so now let's get to um, the, the immigration and uh, ICE raids. There's a lot of threats going on, actually a lot of ICE raids that are going on. Yes. Uh, again, this is a national issue, but it's also a local issue, and it's also it's in your district. So talk about what are your constituents uh, telling you, what are their worries, and, and what can we do? Absolutely. Well, you know, if I can just date back to, you know, when Trump was first elected, um, many of my students, that day after coming in, mm. were in classrooms crying. I had many teachers bring down students um, because they were fearful of the fact that their parents might be deported because they're quote unquote undocumented or what many uh, folks are referring to, my, many members of my community as illegal the impact, the trauma that was caused in many of these students and parents coming into the school. Um, and fast forward to me now being an elected official two years down, two or three years down the line, and now they're actually being raped. Those threats that were made a few years ago are actually being fulfilled. The trauma right now that our youth, our families are going through is ridiculous. Um, what many elected officials and non profit organizations, community organizations, community activists. They're the ones at the front line making sure that people in our community know their rights. People have rights and what we're doing is we're handing out Know Your Rights cards where you're listed, you know, to stay quiet, you have your rights, give this, you know, uh, information to the officer or whoever is asking you questions. Um, and just making sure that our community has these rights because oftentimes because of the language barrier people are taking advantage of. So um, again, many of us are either going into schools, we are going into parks, into many of these nonprofit organizations, uh, buildings, into different churches to give these Know Your Rights workshops because People need to know what their rights are. But one of the things that many of us are very fearful of is when I hear hospitals bringing me in to address the issue that people aren't seeking health care because of these threats, these uh, uh, of, of these raids. To me, that's just, it makes me uh, very afraid to hear also teachers mentioning that some students aren't coming in, mm -hmm. parents aren't going in to work. It's just, um, we need to, and I'm so happy that this year at the, the state of Illinois really passed a lot of uh, bills, pieces of legislation that are going to support our immigrant community, are going to protect our immigrant communities because of the fact that the fear is there. People yeah. aren't um, coming sometimes to, again, like I said, their doctor appointments. So um, one of the things that we need to just continuously do is let people know that they have their rights. And, you know, the thing that sometimes even, uh, I attended one of these Know Your Rights workshops at a local high school, Eric Solorio High School on the southwest side in Cage Park. And um, as I, I was approaching the building, I could see the community activists kind of approaching the door and they asked for my ID, asked me who I was, could they see a card? Because they wanted to verify that I was actually Aaron Ortiz, the state representative. I wasn't there as an ICE official. Mm -hmm. and. I thank those community activists, you know, many organizations uh, that are protecting our communities. They're on that front line, and uh, I just want to thank, you know, give a huge shout out to those organizations uh, because w without them, you know, people don't trust sometimes the government, and they are the ones that have been doing this work for quite some time and are at the front line. You know, because uh, you bring us up, because I think like we're seeing at Can TV uh, with our immigration organizations, and they talk about what you're mentioning here. It's just it's a it's a paralyzing fear. It's like you know, like that that little you know you know kid story, but there's a monster under the bed, and the, and the kid never wants to leave the yes. bed. And so it's the same thing here with, as you said before, without um, people going to school without people going to the, the grocery store, without people going to the hospital, you, you, you know, basic needs that, that, that so many people take for granted, yet there's so many people in the community who are just frozen that, and unable to do anything. Oh. And so, it's, um, and so, and so, so I, I'm leading to this because one of the other things that this that, that, that all this rhetoric the, on the national level uh, is coming, it, it comes right in line as we're doing the 2020 census. Um, and so I know this is something also that's very important to yes. you. So, so first of all, so talk about the the, the the 2020 census. Absolutely. So 
the problem that we're facing as a Latino community is the census is, you know, there's been this talks of this question, the citizenship question being on the census yeah. in 2020 that would, has really created so much fear in our community because once you fill this out and you indicate that you aren't a citizen, you know, who's to guarantee you that someone isn't going to be at your door knocking? And, you know, they, there goes your chance of staying in the United States. So families are fear, are, you know, fearing for their lives to fill this out. And that's why uh, it's very important for government entities who represent large constituencies that are considered to be hard to count communities, whether it's low income communities and oftentimes it's, you know, communities of color, African American communities and uh, Latino communities that aren't counted adequately. And right now there's this, you know, fear that this question might be on, on, the, cens on the census. So many families are, have already made up their mind. I'm not filling this out. I'm not going to fill this out. So because of that, it is our duty um, to make sure that we let our community know well, why is it so important to fill out the census. Right. Well, it's important to fill out the census because you then get to count how many people you are serving in the state of Illinois, in the city of Chicago, in Cook County. And it's important for us to know this because then we know how much money we need for schools, for parks, for roads. And if we do not have an adequate count of our communities, we will not be receiving as much funding from the federal government. And that's what we need. Uh, so I'll continue that yeah, part, so. but it looks like we have a caller uh, tonight. Yes, uh, caller, do you have a question or comment? Hello, caller, are you there? Do you have a question or comment Hello? for State Rep. Ortiz? Hi, yes. sorry, I've seen here first. So I actually had two questions. There was a question I called to ask, but then there was a question that came to my mind as I was listening to what the representative just said. Um, so I guess my first question would be, in terms of agencies that are supposed to be protecting all of Chicago, um, like law enforcement, I feel like sometimes there's a tendency to over-police communities of color and sort of be so heavy-handed with enforcement that it no longer feels like protection. And I kind of wanted him to speak to that and see if he could sort of speak on what, if anything, can be done so that people are not living in perpetual fear mm -hmm. <laughs> for their freedom. Absolutely. Um, that was the question that came to my mind um, as he was talking. Mm -hmm. The question I called to ask, um, I have just been watching the photos of the destruction in the Bahamas, and I've, I've been so sad for those people. And I feel like every year for the past four or five years, we've seen horrific hurricanes like that sort of either ripping up our country or nearby countries. And I just wanted to know in terms of environmental responsibility, what sorts of things is the Illinois State Legislature really doing to make sure we're on a path to look out for our ecosystem and prevent these sorts of disasters from becoming even more frequent? Great. Thank you, caller. Okay. Sure. Those are two great questions. So, great so let's question. talk about the, her fir first question, which was um, uh, the belief of over-policing communities of color. Absolutely. Um, I thank you so much for asking this question, first of all. Uh, I completely agree with what uh, your statement, your uh, question, that many communities of color are being over-policed and not necessarily protected. Um, and I myself uh, have been racially profiled as, as a state representative. I've been pulled over and asked, where did you get those house plates? I was, you know, riding in the neighborhood at 9 p.m. with my younger brother, but because it's, you know, two men of color riding in a, uh, you know, driving in a black Jeep at night, I was pulled over and asked where, where were my house plates. And to me, uh, the reason why that's upsetting is because of the fact that I am able to speak for myself. I have this, uh, I was able to show my ID. I was able to comply. But I think about those students that I used to work with, those young men of color, because oftentimes that's who's being policed is uh, a lot of these young men of color. Being a young, uh, man of color here in the city of Chicago, you know, oftentimes I remember growing up, um, going to the store with my friends, oftentimes uh, telling each other, don't wear your hats, um, don't put the music too loud, 
you know, there should only be two or three of us going. Because if you see a car that has four or five, uh, you know, young men of color, um, most of the time you might be pulled over. So I 100% agree that I think that um, we need to be much more intentional about, you know, government officials, nonprofits, and the Chicago and police um, police officers working together and how we can create community. We need uh, programs where we really have, you know, police officers that are learning how to work with uh, youth of color through mm -hmm. programs that are going to put them in these situations where they are going to actually interact with these young men of color and understand where they're coming from. I mean, every time I uh, am driving within the neighborhood and I see a police officer just kind of creeping up, I start getting this kind of just trauma behind me, it's a bit shaky just because of the experiences that I've had, but I just start thinking of the young kids in my yeah. neighborhood and how they might react. So I think that we need to be much more intentional of working with our police officers and really go back to a lot of the community policing that where they're out walking the beat. They, you know, oftentimes I, I can name a teacher or two uh, uh, or many of my neighbors can name a teacher within their school. This teacher has done this, this teacher yeah. has done that. But how many of our neighbors can actually name a, a police officer or two off their head? So I think that we really need to start taking that approach of community policing a bit more seriously. Wonderful. Uh, then the, the second question, you're talking about you know, uh, Dorian the hurricane, uh, which, which really uh, was terrible on the Bahamas. And so one, the question is in Illinois, and environmental responsibility uh, in Illinois pertaining to climate change. Is there anything you know that, that legislators can do? Absolutely. I think uh, one of the biggest pieces of legislation that has been pushed forward this year was the Clean Jobs Coalition Act, where we're really trying to shift away from, you know, this dirty uh, energy that's being created. That, um, so we really want to try to start shifting more towards uh, uh, whether it's nuclear power, clean energy. Uh, there's uh, four coal plants that still exist in the state of Illinois and they, you know, we also need to understand that many of these coal plants have been huge uh, employers, huge employers for many different towns. Right. So it's very hard to just immediately shut down these coal plants because uh, one of the things that we're making sure to do, if, if that is going to be the case, those thousands of employers, how can we make sure that they're being trained to be uh, put into this Clean, jo clean uh, Jobs Act, where these people will be trained to uh, work at a nuclear plant or work at a wind or solar plant. So I think that um, we, we're we being very intentional about making sure that we're taking strides in environmental jobs, but also making sure that many of these jobs, I oftentimes uh, when these proposals were being brought uh, my way, I made sure to always uh, address the fact that if these jobs are going to be created, I want to make sure that people of color are also going to be getting these new environmental jobs. So, Wonderful. Well, it looks like we are starting to wrap up, but there's one thing. So we've, you had a whirlwind of a, of, yeah. of a first year. Yeah. So forecast for me, the, the upcoming year, what do you see um, as important? What are some things that, the, that you're working on that, that we can possibly be looking forward to down the line? Absolutely. Uh, so. Being my background as a college and career counselor, uh, I'm part of this uh, uh, joint advisory council that was created through so uh, Senate Joint Resolution 41, which what it does, it's just starting to address the fact that there's 46% of Illinois high school grads who enroll into community colleges and are placed in developmental coursework in at least one subject. And what is going on is that students are placed in these courses and when in fact they can succeed in college level courses. And these developmental education courses do not necessarily count as college credit. So we have 46% of Illinois high school students that are attending these community colleges that are taking these classes where they no should credit. They have no credit. So, um, and some of them might be receiving financial aid for that no credit class. So how is it that we can be more strategic in addressing or figuring out displacement or well, what is it that we can do for these high schools to provide mm -hmm. them to so these students can be ready for these placement tests. So I think uh, being a, you know, one of the younger legislators down there with experience in, in higher education, I've really uh, been able to give a lot of my input and some of this input has resulted in this, these type of uh, resolutions where we're really trying to study the problem. 
and mm -hmm. then try to address it. Wonderful. So, okay, so now let me get, let me get this way. We're just about wrapped up here. Um, how would you describe your first year in office? My first year in office was, I think, uh, it was amazing to be part of all of these different issues, whether it was a fair tax, minimum, the $15 minimum yeah. wage, legalizing the legalization of cannabis. But I think understanding that these issues have been worked on for so many years, so many unions, so many activists, uh, nonprofits that are down in Springfield advocating for these issues to happen. People have been fighting for $15 an hour for, since six years ago. So understanding how you know, much time it takes right. to pass an issue. Uh, has really been a, a learning process, and I look forward to going back and getting some more uh, more work done. Wonderful. Hey, let's uh, show uh, the representative's information right here for people who want to contact him. There it is. District office is at 4374 South Archer Avenue in Chicago. Phone number 773-236-0117. And the email, district at reparenortiz.com. That's district at reparenortiz.com. Dot C O M. All right, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so thank much you for being so on the show thank today. So I much. really appreciate, appreciate it. it. I appreciate uh, it. Uh, Sylvia, for answering our phone calls. Thank you for you. Thank you for all the the viewers who watched and for the caller who called in. This has been Political Forum, which is every Wednesday at 7 p.m. We look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, everyone, please have a good night. <laughs>